you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. For many, William Shakespeare is the greatest playwright of all time. His influence and scope still as relevant and as important today as it ever was. Credited with up to 39 plays, 154 sonnets, two long poems and other such verses, he passed away aged 51 in 1616. Yet, from the mid-19th century, doubts about Shakespeare began to appear. How, people asked, could a man without a university education be so well versed in foreign affairs, law, science, medicine and many other subjects at such a young age? Where were the original works? Why did he leave no books or originals in his will? Why were his children illiterate? Many other candidates began to be put forward as the real William Shakespeare, from Sir Francis Bacon to Sir Walter Raleigh and even Christopher Marlowe. But one candidate seems to have risen above all others, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Catherine Chiljan, author of Shakespeare Suppressed, joins me to discuss the case for de Vere in a thought-provoking conversation that may give us more questions than answers at the end of it. A big thank you to Catherine for joining me today. Don't forget, you can sign up for extra content via our Patreon app, which you can find in this week's show notes. You can also subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and we're also on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Artwork for this week's show, as always, was done by my brother, Dean Bestall, and the show is produced by Brennan Stall of the Ghost Story Guys. Now, let's join Catherine to hear the argument to support the supporters of Edward de Vere. For some, the man who is really William Shakespeare. Today, I am delighted to welcome Catherine Children to Mysteries and Monsters. Catherine is the author of Shakespeare Suppressed, the uncensored truth about Shakespeare and his works. Catherine well, became interested in the controversy surrounding Shakespeare's authorship after seeing Charles Oakburn debate this historical conundrum. Catherine, I'm delighted to welcome you to Mysteries and Monsters. Welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well... This is one of those subjects that um, I've been considering looking into for, for quite a while, Catherine, so I was delighted to, to come across your work and be introduced to you. Um, as I alluded to in your introduction, you've had a, a long-standing interest in this um, since your academic career and, and you got your qualifications. So what is it that, that, that caught your imagination about this conspiracy and, and controversy that's been raging? Well, um, yeah, it, it first hit me when I got out of college, um, UCLA um, University, and um, I saw a debate on television, and it was between uh, a prominent English professor and another man who was uh, defending and promoting uh, the 17th Earl of Oxford as the great author. So we have... The Stratford man, the, con the conventional Shakespeare, and then the Earl of Oxford. So it was a debate. And I knew nothing about it. I was totally impartial. And um, the Shakespeare professor really couldn't prove his case at all. All he could do is, for the most part, cast aspersions on the, the author, Charlton Ogburn. And um, Ogburn just made point after point after point for his man. And I, uh, I was really intrigued and I got his book and it was just hands down there was no question that uh, the Earl of Oxford was the great author and but a hundred percent the Stratford man was not the great author and uh, for some reason I just wanted to tell everybody about it and I would read more and then I would tell more and more people and um, it just became a passion <laughs> I mean, it is one of those interesting subjects because th I believe this first came to prominence in 1848 um, that 
people began to question if there really was a person called William Shakespeare because one of the things that's always struck me about this is is that Shakespeare's work is is renowned for its knowledge of of numerous things that back in the late Elizabethan era uh, a commoner such as myself would have no privy knowledge of you know we're talking about uh, sports and law and language and foreign travel which in that era was was essentially beyond the realms of the majority of the english population catherine so there are a lot of and questions music. yes yeah. yeah music astronomy rhetoric medicine there's over 600 references to medicine mm. uh, these are type of subjects italian french um, that you don't get taught at the local grammar school. And that's what they say the Stratford man attended, which is possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't till wasn't for very long. The store, the narrative is that he, you know, helped his father as an early teenager. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly you can't get the type, the breadth and enormity of knowledge that the great author shows in his work from a short period at grammar school. And uh, we have uh, university records from Cambridge and Oxford. We have uh, law school records that have survived. There's no William Shakespeare attended. And that, that was pretty much the main place you could get you know, access to these topics or private tutors. Mm. Mm. Or, you know, it's very possible he had a patron, but no, no patron was named or 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 come forth, you know, saying, oh, yes, uh, you know, he, he, he was my man. You know, mm. Mm. we don't have any lifetime evidence. And uh, maybe that's what we want to, you know, make clear to your listeners. Uh, you know, the world believes the great author was born in Stratford on Avon, William Shakespeare. Um, and yet there is no lifetime evidence that connects him to writing or education. Yeah. I mean, the, the other aspect of this that's always struck me about, about it is that Shakespeare is alleged to have been born in 1564. Yes. Um, now, with the greatest of respect, are we supposed to accept that this young man was a, was a genius across numerous fields by his late twenties, because that's when his work allegedly began to circulate and appear in the in the plays and and, and being performed, is it not? Um, actually, the first reference to him we have is when he was thirty. Mm. So yeah, uh, they, they don't. That's another problem because uh, we don't have any literary um, biography for the Stratford man. We don't know when he started writing plays or became involved in the theater. Um, before 1595, when he was uh, dep deputed with two other people to receive a payment um, from uh, the Queen's for a performance before the Queen. That's the first reference. I mean, he was 30 years old. Now, keep in mind that Christopher Marlowe, he was almost 30 years old when he died. Actually, he was murdered. Hmm. Um, and he had, at that point, written about seven plays or so. So, um, you know, they have to uh, try and cram in about approximately 40 plays and two long narrative poems and 150 sonnets into a fairly small period of maybe about 20 years for this Stratford man. But it's all speculation. Mm, mm. I mean, that's the other, one of the other aspects. Is obviously Marlowe is often put forward by some as as who could be actually William Shakespeare. But once again, you have this age that say that Marlowe was a, an intellectual giant to have created and and completed this body of work in such a, a short period of time as well. Right, right. Um, yeah, and it, it's very unlikely. I mean, we have documents showing that he died. Mm. Uh, so you would have to believe that he did not die, that he uh, perhaps, I think the theory is that he uh, left and lived in Europe and wrote plays from there. But, you know, that, again, it's more speculation. Mm. And, you know, it's unprovable. Yeah. Uh, the important thing is to know that there is no proof that the Stratford man was the great author lifetime in the lifetime it's only 
after he died when it's, when it happened. And it was seven years after he died, not right when he died. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, that's why it is an unproven theory. And in fact, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in England, you know, they're, they're a registered charity. They did not accept a 40,000 pound donation from the Shakespeare Authorship Co Coalition at doubtaboutwill.org hmm. um, to prove their case in a mock trial. You know, that's a lot of money hmm. uh, that the charity, you know, they didn't go for. And uh, I would encourage people to read about that at the website doubtaboutwill.org. It's uh, very interesting. Yes, there are numerous situations and problems with, with the whole William Shakespeare being the authors of this. Primarily for me, one of the biggest things, like, a, like I referred to earlier, was this incredible knowledge of foreign countries and travel and trade and how things worked in, in foreign courts and, and royal houses. And, and we're supposed to believe that this merchant son was, was able to garner this knowledge either via grammar school or through some kind of osmosis, one would suspect, and in regards to learning about these far-flung places that surely he had no access to, whereas the Earl of Oxford was a well-travelled man, and looking at his reputation, he seems to be the best fit out of all the, the alleged real William Shakespeare's, Catherine. Yes. Um, in fact, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the founding of our theory, or the discoverer of the real Shakespeare, uh, J.T. Looney. And he wrote a book, Shakespeare identified in the 17th Earl of Oxford. And um, he was an English schoolmaster, and he taught Shakespeare for many years. And he just couldn't, um, you know, after knowing Shakespeare so well and knowing his incredible knowledge, he couldn't quite square the Stratford man with this incredible genius uh, of multiple, multiple <laughs> knowledge. Um, and he did it very methodically. He made a list of what the great author knew, um, like 20 or so characteristics. And then he looked for someone of the period who was a, a known writer to see who, who, who best matches it. And um, actually, one of his methods was he, he took uh, a certain rhyme scheme uh, that used in Venus and Adonis. I think it's called Rhyme Royal. And he tried to find another writer of that same Rhyme Royal in an Elizabethan anthology. He just picked one up and, you know, looked through it. And there were only two writers of that same rhyme scheme. One was anonymous and the other was the Earl of Oxford. So that, and then he uh, opened the DNB, Dictionary of National Biography, and he, he saw so many parallels uh, that he, you know, he said, this has got to be the man. And then he wrote this wonderful book. And um, so it's been 100 years since the real Shakespeare is discovered, but um, the gatekeepers of Shakespeare won't allow it, which is really tragic. Mm. The Earl of Oxford. I think the the nicest way I can describe him is a bit of an eccentric character. To say he had an interesting life, I believe, Catherine, would be a vast understatement because he's <laughs> what one I would consider at that period an, an extremely scandalous man. He's his reputation is is incredible because it it seems that he had a real problem with money and it, there doesn't seem to be any kind of record of where everything kept going it's very peculiar when you look into his life that he consistently seems to be borrowing money or running up debts which in those days were were quite substantial god knows what they would be in today's terms um and i found that incredibly fascinating that we have a gentleman here um who was classed as a child child prodigy i believe he he was entered into education at eight i believe is that yes, correct at cambridge cambridge university Yes. And and yet he seemed to have developed a reputation, became a, a very popular member of, of Queen Elizabeth's court, but then became involved in, in a sex scandal because he uh, had the temerity to get one of her maids pregnant, I believe, <laughs> yes. uh, while still married. Um, 
uh, and disavowed the poor lady and refused to sort of do do the right thing or well not that he could because he was obviously married as well so right, right. He, he seems to have he seems to have had it all and had a wonderful ability throughout his life to throw it away if we are to believe the historical record yes well he was a very passionate man <laughs> and <laughs> i mean you can read it in his works you mm. know his his kind of love of humanity and his extreme sensitivity to everything and yeah um his scandal started well actually you can say um pretty early um when he was around you know in his early 20s he even um mary queen of scots noted that he was having an affair with queen elizabeth <laughs> which was kind of interesting and then he was engaged to be married to uh, william cecil lord burley his daughter hmm. And Lord Burley was, you know, the main power behind the throne. Um, but he, he didn't want to marry her, and uh, per, perhaps because of his involvement with the Queen. And he didn't show up to his first wedding day, <laughs> but eventually he did. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, he took, as you mentioned, the Grand Tour of Europe, and he was without her and for about a year and a half. And on his way back, he, somebody told him that his daughter was born a little bit later than he was told, meaning the child wasn't his. Mm -hmm. And he believed it with, without question. And she was trying to you know, meet him um, at the dock where he was coming off the boat. And uh, he, he didn't even look at her, passed her by, and was separated for a few years. And that was uh, what he called in one of his letters, the fable of the world. Everybody knew it. I mean, it, was, it was greatly scandal, scandalous. <laughs> and during this uh, separation with her, uh, as you mentioned, he had an affair with a, a lady of the queen, one of the queen's attendants. She got pregnant. When the queen found out about it, he, he was thrown in the tower and the, the baby and the, the mistress as well, you know. And uh, the mistress, uh, her name was Anne, Anne Vavazor. Um, she, uh, she was from the Yorkshire area, I believe. And, um, she was a beautiful, dark lady. And as you read in Shakespeare's sonnets, he was obsessed by a beautiful, dark lady. So everything with Oxford just fits like a glove. And he was a known playwright and poet, recognized, uh, called best in comedy uh, by one contemporary. But we don't have any plays with his name attached. And um, I think that was purposeful. Um, you know, when you're somebody of his high status, a 17th Earl of Oxford, um, very, one of the oldest families in England at the time, um, you, you didn't want to, it, to be known that your passion was writing, creative writing and poems and plays. That was considered frivolous. Hmm. You're supposed to do something a little bit more um more dutiful to the prince, hmm. you know, being a, a judge or a counselor or a soldier, you know, something like that. Uh, and, you know, he didn't want to hurt his family name. So he, he wanted it to be quiet during his lifetime. And especially um, the drama being associated with the theater, that was considered déclassé. So um, he, it, although he was passionate about it and he loved it, he kept it quiet. Fully expecting, however, that after his death, his works would be attributed to him. But that never happened. And that that's the problem we have to deal with. Mm. I mean, it is incredible when you look at the power of the establishment at that period as well, that, you know, we have these uh, allegations of being Elizabeth's lover and uh, his position in the court and then his fall from favour. Even in, drags in characters such as Sir Walter Raleigh, um, who I believe had to basically beg for his release from the tower so he was put under house arrest so we have a, a gentleman who was clearly very well connected um, and highly thought of in some circles but yet for as many people that admired him he seemed to have as many detractors yes and um yeah like a, a major one was uh, sir christopher hatton mm. who you know really tried to ruin him financially um, you know, being the Earl of Oxford, he had certain debts to the crown. And um, you know, so he was constantly selling his estates. You know, he started out with 100 or so estates he inherited. And um, he ended up with, you know, very few in the very end. 
Um, but yeah, people were were against him um, in the court. It, you know, I guess there was a lot of you know backbiting and things like that going on. Um, he may have been lampooned in uh, the play Twelfth Night, the comedy, mm -hmm. as Malvolio. There's a, there's a lot of identifiers uh, between Malvolio and Christopher Hatton, and he was the I believe he was the Lord Chancellor. Mm -hmm. So you know he, he he didn't like to be satirized, and other courtiers like as I mentioned William Cecil Lord Burley, many see. Uh, the character of Polonius in Hamlet as being a lampooning of him. Mm. And it, you know, it makes you wonder, I mean, not only would it kind of not make you happy, but um, how, how could uh, someone supposedly of humble origins like the Stratford man get away with satirizing very powerful people? Mm. But it's possible if he was, were the Earl of Oxford, who, who knew these people intimately, Mm. And had a certain standing and protection of the queen, you know. After after she released him from the tower for his uh, his affair, um, a few years later she gave him a thousand pound annuity, mm. and this is in the state records. And n no reason was given why mm. uh, he he received this. And and when she died and King James came on the throne, it was renewed. Mm. So um, he was doing something important, and Oxfordians like me think it was, you know, to help produce the Shakespeare plays. I think initially for the Queen's entertainment, the Queen and her courtiers, because these plays started uh, as performances, private performances before the Queen. But later for the public stage, and I think plays like Henry V, which are very patriotic. Um, I think they were written, and there's evidence for it, uh, just before uh, the Spanish Armada in, you know, invasion. Um, they knew it was coming, and this was sort of a very patriotic play. Mm. Um, so I think there was also political purposes involved. I mean, the other aspect of all this is that, that you know, this was a dangerous time to be a critic of the establishment because uh, history is littered with numerous people who were considered favourites of, of the Queen at that time who ended up coming to a rather sticky end. Um, so it wasn't a, a situation where someone could be openly critical and not expect repercussions. Yes, yes, it's true. Um, Look at uh, the Essex Rebellion. Mm -hmm. That was in uh, 1601, and just a couple days before the Earl of Essex tried to, in essence, seize the throne from Queen Elizabeth, um, the play of Richard II was performed to sort of warm up the um, the Londoners to for a revolution. Of course, it failed. Um, but here we have. Right after the performance, uh, I mean, a few days after the revolution and the performance, uh, they questioned the actors as to, you know, how did, how did this happen? But they did never questioned the supposed author of the play, William Shakespeare. And uh, that play was used specifically because it showed the deposition of a monarch, which is Richard II. Mm. So, um, yeah, it can get very political. Mm. I, I mean, and especially the other aspect of all this is that Elizabeth was out without a, a husband and a suitor. So one could argue that one of the reasons that there were so many um, situations going on behind the scenes was that people were very concerned about who may come to favour and, and end up becoming the husband of the, of the monarch as well. And I think that perhaps has had a lot to do with the alleged, re, you know, writing out of history because he he seems to have been sort of airbrushed out of a lot of things, and it's only sort of through deep scholarly investigations that his reputation and his his life seems to have come back to the fore. Yes, he was pretty much cut out of the record. We have no uh, really no accounts um, between the Queen and the Earl of Oxford or the Queen and William Shakespeare, the great author. Um, and yet, she we have uh, evidence that she knew and met uh, Spencer, Edmund Spencer of the Fairy Queen, and John Lilly, who was a playwright, who performed, uh, had plays performed before the Queen. But Oxford seems to have been cut out. And... Um, 
I think because of the po political satires that were in the plays. I think it totally makes sense. And I think that after his death and after the Stratford man's death, the Stratford man was involved in the theater. I believe that the powers that be wanted to decontextualize these plays hmm. from their political value or their biographies or portraits of powerful people. And they they confuse the two entities, the man using the pen name William Shakespeare, who was the Earl of Oxford, and the Stratford man, who, who actually was involved in the theater at pretty much in a financial aspect as a, a shareholder and a member of an acting company. He, he may have been an actor, although we don't have any evidence that he actually acted. Um, and this was done after their, both of their deaths, and the... It, instrument was a book published in 1623. We today call it the first folio, mm -hmm. first meaning the first edition of a large uh, book of folio-sized paged book of Shakespeare plays, 36 Shakespeare plays. And it's in the opening prefatory pages of this book where the idea that the great author hailed from Stratford-on-Avon came came into existence. On one page in a tribute to Shakespeare by Ben Jonson, he mentions Sweet Swan of Avon. He calls him that. And then a couple pages later, another writer makes a mention to Shakespeare's Stratford Monument. So, you know, you put those two together and you can assume that he came from Stratford on Avon, even though there are many towns in England with the word Stratford on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mistake was, quote unquote, the mistake was made. And from that point on, 1623 onwards, is when it started. Mm. I mean, the other aspect of all this is, is that essentially after this point, he seems to have completely dropped out of favour, whoever Shakespeare is, for a, for a good 150 years. Why do you think that is, Catherine? If he was such, such a celebrated author, and we have people such as Johnson singing his praises at that time, because obviously Ben Johnson was, you know, in, in, incredibly well known throughout the land. Um, I found it very peculiar that he just seems to completely drop off the radar till sort of the late 18th century, and then all of a sudden he's then uh, promoted as as the greatest playwright of all time. Yes, uh, a lot has to do with um, a, a, a great uh, Shakespeare festival uh, that was performed uh, came in the uh, 1750s. Mm. Uh, a famous uh, I forget his name actor uh, started it, and that's from that point on, from the, around the seven mid 1700s on. Stratford on Avon was the place to go um, to to know about Shakespeare, but before that. You know, certainly during the Stratford man's lifetime, the town didn't recognize him as the great author. Uh, his his children didn't recognize him as a great author. Um, you know, uh, nobody went there before the first full you know. And I think that, yeah, it, it was even the town itself. It took 100 years for them to recognize it as the place the birthplace of the great author, William Shakespeare. So, yeah, something something definitely depressed <laughs> him getting credit. And perhaps we can look as early as the year 1640 when uh, someone wrote a book anonymously and you know, wrote passages about various people and things. And one passage to, was to William Shakespeare. And they said, Shakespeare we must be silent in thy praise. So 1640, I mean, the Stratford man had been dead for more than 20 years. Uh, the real Shakespeare, the Earl of Oxford, um, more than 30 years at that point. Um, why do we have to be silent in our praise of Shakespeare? So that's very odd. I something political, yes. Yeah, very much so. I mean, there are numerous. I mean, one of the things that's always struck me about this is is the fact that his his children are are essentially, from the records that we have that remain, seem to have been illiterate. Which, if we are to believe that the real William Shakespeare was was this intellectual genius, I. I cannot comprehend the fact that his his children couldn't write their own names. Yes, that uh, that's really it's un unthinkable. I mean, look at the wonderful heroines we have in Shakespeare who were literate, especially Portia in The Merchant of Venice. I mean, here you have a woman, um, you know, dressed as a man, but pleading a case 
for um, her her husband's friend, you know, against the uh, the, the Shylock, the, the moneylender. Um, it just doesn't make sense that his two daughters would not would be illiterate. And um, what about the the remaining? Uh, things that we have in the Strapper man's handwriting. All we have, no letters at all, no manuscripts, nothing. All we have are six signatures, and they're all very badly formed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that show that it appears he could he could barely hold a pen. And three of these appear on his will, and the other three on legal documents. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's another interesting thing. If you look at the Strapper man's will, you know, he, he gives many, many, many items, but no books, no Bible, no Shakespeare plays that he supposedly wrote, and nothing, nothing like uh, theater costumes or, or anything that you would expect somebody who was deeply involved in the theater would have. It's just a blank. It just, it's just really a common will of the time period. Mm. Well, I mean, it's obvious where the where the plays are because you know one of the great one of the great conspiracy theories is that uh, Shakespeare's plays are buried in Oak Island, Catherine, which I'm sure you've you've seen I mentioned have. before, um, which yes. has always made me chuckle because that is that is one of the other weird things about this is that there is no historical record of of, of any of his writings at all, and it's all uh, essentially. Um, copies of his work that have that, that have come into prominence and have remained to this day which like you say in his will he has uh, no library which for a man who is supposed to be as well read and as well educated and as knowledgeable as him seems unthinkable yes it's a great <laughs> mystery any way you look at it for the Stratford man um, um, and it's it's really an unpro unproven theory and we should really um, you know give him his due he was a involved in the theater financially um, and he, he was a real person but he didn't write the play so let's kind of just put him aside and look at who really did because you're going to get um, a fuller understanding of them and you mentioned it was great you brought it up the um, the plays were only have survived in print form they very well could be in, in Oak Island I don't know I hope <laughs> I, I hope they're buried somewhere instead of uh, underwater. Yes. But um, but the most people are unaware, and I, I get into this in my my book, Shakespeare Suppressed. Um, they were appeared in horrible condition. You know, they, the the scholars have the term good quartos and bad quartos. The quarto is the page size. So for the individual plays that were printed. Um, Half of them are in terrible condition. In fact, uh, Romeo and Juliet, the first edition, it was called just a couple years later as a monstrous theft. And not only just because of it being stolen, it's a pirated edition, but the, the terrible condition that it was in, it's unreadable. Same with Pericles, another Shakespeare play. It's, it's unreadable. Why? Why are they unreadable? Because the great author wasn't giving them the original texts. Mm. And that's totally against the narrative of, you know, Stratfordian scholars who say, oh, no, he was writing for money. Don't you think he would give them the real text and, and have many, many printed to make money to get a cut? You know, it doesn't it doesn't work. So what this does again show you that this was somebody who didn't want his works printed during his lifetime and that that is the profile of somebody who was highly ranked and, and actually we should be grateful for these pirated editions because actually the first folio that book of Shakespeare plays um, it contained some of those bad versions and it also contained um, 20 plays that had never been in print before so it's a very important work um, so we have to be grateful that we have what we have but perhaps if we drop the Stratford man and put our focus on the Earl of Oxford maybe we can find where the originals are I you know I my my gut is is that he did bury them or, or deposit them somewhere and maybe we can try and find them we can have the hope and uh, 
Otherwise, I don't think we've yet read the real Shakespeare plays, and that that would be the exciting thing. Plus, like you say, the first folios is the is you know, is a collection. Obviously, stylistically, I know some people have often said that there are marked differences between certain pieces of work in his alleged portfolio. To be fair, we, we've no proof that he wrote everything that's in the first folio. It could have been simply a collection of of works from that period, could it not? Um, yes, it, it could have been, although it was, you know, the title says it was Master William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. Um, but yeah, there there have been theories that it was a group theory. Mm. I think, uh, for me, who've read, I think, almost all the plays, uh, there there is a certain voice, um, uh, augmented voice, you know, uh, August voice. I'm oh, sorry, that's the word I meant. Um, that that flows through them all. And uh, my guess is yes, he he wrote them all. But you know, far earlier than we think. Um, I think the Earl of Oxford was writing as early as 12, and and he probably you know started maybe Romeo and Juliet was really early, and then uh, maybe 10 years later he updated. I think I think what we're seeing is a compendium of his different ages mm. when he did rewriting. And, you know, maybe he had a life event that he thought would fit perfectly with a pre play that he had written and he added to it. Mm. So I think that's that that's what's going on. But to really unfold them all, um, we, we need the true biography and then we can date them. Mm. I mean, what in regards to the aspect of, of plagiarism as well? Because I know there are certain accusations in regards to the fact that some of the plays were actually written by other people and he simply rewrote them. Or whoever, whoever is the author of these plays, Catherine, he, they yes. were updated and rewrote. And I think one of the ones I, I seem to remember that, that often causes the most consternation is King Lear, is it not? Uh, yes. Uh, well, you see, <laughs> there's several... Shakespeare plays, King Lear is one of them, where an earlier anonymous work appears that's almost the same play, mm. like for King Lear, like King L-E-A-R, right? That's the play mm. as we know it. But a few years before, there was another play called King L-E-I-R. <laughs> yes. They are two different plays, but they have the same theme, the, the similar characters, similar everything, but they're slightly different. And um, so the Shakespeare scholars have to say, oh, well, he must have borrowed everything from this earlier play. <laughs> and there are eight examples of that as far as, you know, like taming of the shrew and taming of a shrew. Mm. There's a few others. And um, so they have to say, oh, yeah, he's constantly borrowing and rewriting. But how, how come they can't say, no, this is his early version? And then he later updated it and rewrote it. Mm. That's what was going on. But they have to, you know, reduce him to being a plagiarizer. How can the most educated, creative genius of all time, or one of them, mm. um, be have to have to resort to other works to get inspiration. It doesn't make sense. Mm. Mm. Especially because he was so prolific. So for for him to sort of cheat a little in regards to those works, it, that doesn't make any sense with the with the scholarly argument that he he was this genius. Because surely right. he he would not have to rely on the work of lesser individuals. Surely. Yes, and it lessens him. That's what they're doing. I mean, they laud him. These contemporary scholars, but they also are lessening him. And it's not fair. <laughs> um, because they have the wrong model. They have the Stratford man as their model. And, you know, they can't fit all of these, you know, they can't imagine that he wrote 10 more plays than, than, than he already has. So they have to say that he was a plagiarizer, or he has to say that he co-wrote with other writers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the only way they can explain it. But if they, if we're talking about a man who was writing as a teenager and his entire life, 
you can fit it in then, but you can't cram it in approximately 20 years, you know, when several of the years of his life as Stratford Man are called the lost years. They don't even know what he was doing or where he was. Well, yes, I, I mean, that's not stopped certain academics creating a, a fic- it seems, a fictional <laughs> fictional life for him because I've... I've... No, we're talking about those lost years where his prime years of his life, his 20s. Mm. You know, how can they be lost? Look at uh, the superstar actor of the period, Edward Allen. Mm. You know all about him. He was a producer, theater producer, and a very famous actor. And, and also he probably wrote a few plays too so we, we we know all about his life story how come you know they claim that for the strapper man but we don't have anything to account for it yeah <laughs> absolutely i mean i've i've often seen versions of his life where it, it it simply there doesn't seem to be any evidence um i've, I've seen essentially allegations of him being aware of the gunpowder plot uh, of of the Essex Rebellion as well, and you just think, well, wh- where is the historical record for this? It just seems to be um, flights of fancy to to create this kind of evidence that there doesn't seem to be any historical documentation to support them. No, there's nothing. You know, there's two types of evidence. There's lifetime and posthumous. Mm. The Stratford man's case. First of all, he never claimed to be the author at all. Mm. or his family, right? Um, and all the, the evidence is posthumous for the Stratford man, all after he died. So, you know, it's it's time to recognize that. Just It's a historical question, and follow the evidence. Um, you know, uh, Hamlet, for example. Hamlet was a university student. He was a nobleman. He was a courtier. He was a traveler. He was on a ship that was attacked by pirates and he lost everything. He killed somebody. He patronized an acting company. He loved the daughter of the king's minister. You know, all of these are applicable to the Earl of Oxford. They all fit him like a glove. Not, none of those things describe the great author, I uh, just describe this rapper now. Um, and yet, the Shakespeare's professor will tell you, oh, Hamlet is probably the most autobiographical of his plays. How? <laughs> How is this? I mean, they're confusing two different people. They're confusing the great author's voice with the Stratford man. It, yeah, I mean, the pirate thing is very interesting because I, I believe that happened to De Vere as he returned from his grand tour, did it not? Yes, yes. And um, and he was lucky he was recognised because I think he would he would have he would have lost his life. But that that makes me laugh because the, clearly he was a very well known person for someone to go. Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> We've got yeah, the Earl one of, of Oxford the pirates here. recognized him. Yeah, I mean they recognized him, and and he was he stayed alive. I mean, but he could have died at that point. So, yeah, we've got to we've got to look at the facts and look at the comprehensive evidence. There is no smoking gun proof that the Earl of Oxford wrote the works. I admit that, but you have to look at the cumulative evidence, the circumstantial evidence that all point in his direct direction, with many life parallels the education, the superlative education. Um, I mean, really, what more do you need? He was also a famous playwright in his day, but nothing survives in his name. Mm -hmm. But really, did they survive in the name of William Shakespeare? And the fact that actually contemporaries thought that the name was a pen name. Mm -hmm. Um, A man named John Davies um, wrote a, a little poem to Shakespeare, and he called him our English Terence. Now, in that time period, it was believed that Terence, who was the ancient Roman playwright, it was believed that he was the front man for two aristocratic authors. By, by calling Shakespeare our English Terence, it was in essence saying, you're a man using a pen name or a front. Mm. Yeah. And also other contemporary writers described him as a man of rank, a generous patron, uh, one one said he was di- had been dead in 1607. This man died in 1616. Mm-hmm. Uh, this person in 1607, he he referred to Shakespeare as being the neighbor of the muses. Now the muses were the Greek goddesses of the arts, right? Mm-hmm. They were immortal, right? So um, 
being a neighbor of an immortal person, it, it also means you're immortal, meaning at that point you're dead. But your works are immortal because you don't say someone's immortal while they're alive, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Very neighbor true. of a muse means you're in essence, you're, you're dead. Mm -hmm. um, and two years later, when uh, Shakespeare's sonnets uh, was published, 1609, um, the the uh, dedication page refers to him as our ever living poet, ever living. Um, that that's another implication that someone is dead because you don't say you're ever living when you're alive, right? You're like a legend in your own time, you know. Yes. Is what is. So um, also, Evere is kind of a pun on Edward de Vere, F. E. Vere. Hmm. Ever, or ever living poet. So yeah, I mean we have to look at all the contemporary evidence, which I, I give in, in my book, and um, it all points to the Earl of Oxford. Yeah, I mean it does seem when you look at the the the, the, the accepted version of it that that the Stratford man is essentially a ghost out of time because he seems to just drift around with no real substance to his his life and his education and and that's the other thing that that perplexes me when you start to really look at things and and question the historical evidence and the the given version that we have in this day and age he he just drifts around and and there doesn't seem to be any substance which once again is very very confusing when you look at say for example somebody uh, other authors of that era and that age such as Cervantes who wrote Don Quixote I mean we have a a complete record essentially of, of his life and where he went and his time in the army and losing losing the use of an arm and, and being seriously wounded it's perplexing that people seem to be very easily in in accepting this alleged version of events yeah, I mean, you any any like a literature class or a class on art. Um, often, the, the instructor will preface um, their lectures with a biography <laughs> of, of the person in, involved, and then then later relate it to the works. Whether it, it doesn't matter if you're a painter or a poet or what have you, a sculptor, you're going to see that some connection there but um in to my understanding um if you take a shakespeare course you don't get the, the life at all you, they barely go into the life because there's no no literary life as far as we know it it's entirely speculative mm. and that's why a lot of the uh shakespeare biographies that you know constantly get published and co people constantly buy them there there are a good deal of speculation in there They're, and and pretty much the information they have is of the period you know what the age was like or you know who was who was in the, the king or queen or or what have you hmm. that's what 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 these books are and, they, and and sometimes they just create events out of whole cloth Mm -hmm. Like one um, one professor, um, you know, claimed that um, that uh, Shylock, you know, in The Merchant of Venice, that 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 was inspired by the hanging of a Jewish doctor. I, I now I, I forget the name, um, but I mean, he didn't qualify himself. He just said that's that's what did it, you know. And so Shakespeare picked it up and wrote about it. Without qualification, I mean, you can't present things as truth unless you have some facts. But it's it's gone beyond that, where they just they can't qualify anymore because it's just so ingrained that he was the author. <laughs> so it's okay to do that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I think to essentially steal De Vere's legacy, I think for some people at that period would have been the perfect response to his his life. I suspect by attributing it to a pseudonym or a, a person that wasn't of any you know no no disrespect but of, of no real importance at the period so if they well, were able to take his legacy and pass it on to somebody else and essentially steal it from him that for, for many would have been the, the best form of revenge against him well um y y yes um for for those who uh, were depicted like for example um sir robert cecil uh, many peer many people of the period associated Sir Robert Cecil 
who was the Queen's secretary, uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, as uh, depicted in Richard III, Shakespeare's play, Richard III, because they both had a, a hunchback or, you know, scoliosis or whatever. Mm. And um, so, yeah, uh, I'm sure he didn't like that association. So, uh, and also his father as well, being depicted as Polonius, um, kind of a, a, a cunning daffy minister. Yeah, they, they didn't want that posterity to know this or the general public at the time to know this. So that's why decontextualizing the works by throwing it on the Stratford man, it took care of everything and it worked. I mean, it's, you know, to this day, we still, <laughs> the majority still believe it, but me and people like me are, are trying to change that. You know. Yeah, I, I do believe it. it is something. I mean, what I've often found frustrating about this situation in general is that th there seems to be a complete lack of acknowledgement of of the questions about the authorship and the mysterious life and and the fact that this chap just turns up in the middle of nowhere at the age of 30 as a as a literary genius and we're supposed to go well fair enough and when anybody seems to question it that people are often insulted or or deemed to be conspiracy nuts i i, I i've seen people claim that this theory has only exploded since 9-11, which, as, as leaps of faith go, has to be one of the strangest I've ever heard. Uh, this has really uh, took, gotten on fire since, uh, like, the 1850s, when books really started to come out. Mm. And uh, it's people who, who just can't see the evidence for the Stratford man questioned it. And so there were many anti-Stratfordian books written, and rightly by people who believed in Francis Bacon. Mm. And I think they, you know, they had good cause to think that Bacon really was the writer because he had the education, he, he had the connections at court, he, he, was a, he had law school, uh, you know, he worked for the government. So, it, you know, he had the insight, it all makes sense. However, his body of work was enormous. Mm. And it was mostly scientific and philosophical. And it's just kind of hard to connect two huge bodies of work to one individual. And and plus he was not known as a playwright. You know, he wasn't he wasn't praised for his uh, creative writing. Yeah, and there are so there are only so many hours in the day, regardless. <laughs> you know, to be able to you know, if it was Bacon, to be able to achieve what he did, you know, like his body of work anyway is is incredible. I, I have no idea where he could have possibly found the time. Yeah, it, it all points to the Earl of Oxford, and um, we we need uh, we need the Shakespeare orthodoxy to really own up to the problems of biography. They do to each other. If you read some of their journals and maybe go, maybe they do at their conferences, but they don't do it to the general public because they don't want to break up the, the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, um, perhaps they, you know, they don't want their PhDs to be invalidated. I don't know what it is, but it seems to me if you have so much wonderful biography with the Earl of Oxford that fits the Shakespeare plays like a glove. Why wouldn't you want to know your man? Mm. <laughs> Why are you satisfied knowing nothing? Plus, I suppose they'd have to change the date of World Book Day, which is obviously Shakespeare's birthday, isn't it? Alleged. Or is it his date of death that World Book Day is the April 23rd? Yeah, so uh, I, I believe that's one of the reasons that they chose that date is because of Shakespeare, isn't it? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yes, I didn't know that. Because yeah. I think uh, Cervantes, Don Quixote, I think he died on April the 22nd. So they, they, that's what it was. It was down to the fact that two legendary authors passed away at the same time. So that's yeah. why th that. So that might <laughs> that might cause a few problems as well, Catherine. I suspect. <laughs> uh, I mean, going forwards in regards to the the continuation and looking for the evidence in in support of finding out who really who the real William Shakespeare is. Where do you think we go next, Catherine? What is what is the as you refer to, you know, there is no smoking gun at the moment, but you know, as we've seen in in numerous fields over the years, occasionally things turn up. I mean, over over here in the UK recently, somebody found a a book, a 900-year-old book that had just basically been shoved down the back of a bookcase. So hmm. 
Um, and, and, you know, and people often find incredible works of literature that have been scribbled away or hidden inside things. Do you suspect that we just need to keep looking and something may turn up? Yes, I do. I do. Um, keep in mind that there are very few researchers for the Earl of Oxford, just a handful of us. We're really, we, we occasionally, you know, get notice in the media, but we're a very small group. And when the world accepts the Earl of Oxford as the great author, we're going to have thousands of people looking for this type of evidence. Um, but right now it's very small. So I, I have hope that as more and more people come to this realization who are interested, we will find the smoking grumper. We're bound to find a manuscript in their old man Oxford's handwriting at some point. Um, we do have letters in his handwriting and um, about, um, and I think around 40 or 50, I don't know how many now. Not all of these are like business letters. Hmm. But we don't have any play, plays, manuscripts that have survived. So I'm, he's bound to ha have something squirreled away somewhere, maybe in, in the wall of an old house. I, I'm just hoping for that day. That's all we can really do. Yeah, I mean, with the amount of estates he had, there's a, there's a good chance something's hidden somewhere. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if you read um, the sonnets, you know, which were mostly written in the first uh, person. And he knew that his name would not live on. Mm. I think some sort of deal may have been made in exchange. So he's, for example, in Sonnet 81, he's speaking to the fair youth, the, the beautiful young man uh, that he loves very much. And, and he says, from hence your memory, death cannot take. Although in me, each part will be forgotten. Your name from hence immortal life shall ha have, though I, once gone, to all the world must die. So that's a very sad <laughs> realization. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the fair youth's name is going to live forever, but not his name. And my explanation for this is, well, most, uh, I, I would say it's pretty much universal that the fair youth was uh, the Earl of Southampton, uh, a courtier of Queen Elizabeth's court, and he was the fair youth, right? Shakespeare, the first work in print of Shakespeare was Venus and Adonis, which was a long narrative poem. And the dedication was to the Earl of Southampton. So you have the Earl of Southampton and Shakespeare connected on one in one work and then the following year the same thing on another work called The Rape of Lucrece where he dedicated it to him. So his name will be forever meaning the Earl of Southampton's because his is associated with Shakespeare. But Shakespeare's name will not live forever because Shakespeare is a pen name. Mm. And the man's real name will not be known forever. That That's what it boils down to. And he knew it. And we need to get into why he knew it and what was the cause. Mm. And I, I give my version in my book. Fantastic. It, it is such a conundrum. And it having spoken with you, Catherine, I now have far more questions that I need to be answered. <laughs> In regards to this, because it's, like I say, it's something I've been aware of for a very long time. And I think in the history of literature, it's probably the biggest situation that I'm aware of where there is such a contention about the true authorship. I mean, obviously, there have been numerous situations where people have, have written books under pseudonyms and then it's come out. You know, obviously, George Eliot is a prime example. Mary Shelley, when Frankenstein was first printed, didn't have a name on it because they said nobody would buy a book written by a woman. Literature is filled with uh, scandals and, and misappropriations and uh, pseudonyms. So I, I don't understand what the the problem with, with Shakespeare seems to be, that it possibly cannot be anybody else, and yet we're expected to believe that a, that a young merchant's son from Stratford-upon-Avon with no history of education or travel is supposed to have been a literary, literary genius by the age of 30. I think that the world would have figured it out that it was a pen name um, 
had the first folio not had that image of a man, that iconic image, you know, we now know that black and white, Mm. um, where it gives a a figure of a man. We don't know who it was based on because the Stratford man was dead at that point. Mm. Um, To me, I think it was a made up image, but um, it depicts this man as a gentleman, but that's all. Mm. And um, I think that that's what led it itself to the idea that he was a gentleman from Stratford-on-Avon. Mm. And I think that if there weren't two William Shakespeare's involved in the theater, that they were allowed to merge, um, I think that we would have figured out that William Shakespeare was a pen name a long time ago. <laughs> So, um, I, and it, I believe me, I'm not blaming the Stratford man he, he, the, or the, the Earl of Oxford. This happened after they both died. Mm. It, was, it was cooked up this way. Mm. And, but hey, it's been 400 years. It's time. <laughs> Let's give the true author his due. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's my, part of my passion. Yeah. Well, Catherine, thank you very much for expanding my knowledge and uh, testing my uh, <laughs> historical uh, education as well. You're, <laughs> never, never you're mind. You're very well versed in it. Yes. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Um, where can everybody find out more about your work and your book and, and your website? Um, yeah, my website is shakespearesuppressed.com. That's the title of my book. And um, you can go there and contacted me and um or you can buy the book on amazon it's also in the uk amazon uh, just go to their website and um, i'm part of an organ- organization called the shakespeare oxford fellowship and you can go to shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org and on october 2nd and 3rd of this year we're doing an online symposium which is free to the public Anyone can go to the site and register for free, and you can watch um, various lecturers give their talks, and I'm going to be one of them. So you can meet me (laughs) on October 3rd when I'll appear, and um, I I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be on your show and tell everybody about this. No, well, thank you very much, and I shall put links to everything that you've mentioned in the show notes so everybody can find it at their leisure. And uh, once again, I will uh, say thank you very much for joining me today. It's been fascinating, uh, confusing, and like I say, (laughs) very perplexing. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you again. My pleasure. (laughs) 